This video is sponsored by SciSpot, the best tech stack for modern biotech. Welcome to this episode, Anissa. Great to have you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Do you want to start with a quick introduction, give a background about your uh, journey, your role? Um, so my name is Anissa Kalinowski. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Halo Biosciences. And if I go way back to the beginning, um, I'm Canadian um, and I have spent my career in biotech pharma and I was really inspired by my parents were both physicians. So I kind of grew up with medicine in the blood and uh, I did a short stint exploring a field of work in diplomacy. I got my undergraduate degree at the School of Foreign Service uh, from Georgetown. And I decided that it was too political uh, and that I really enjoyed the true north of science um, a little bit more. And uh, I launched into my career in uh, consulting actually. Uh, for biopharma and healthcare systems, and um, you know, have have followed a path in healthcare, biotech, and pharma ever since. How did you end up becoming the founder of Halo Bioscience? Like, what is your journey? What motivated you to start this company? That's a great question. Um, so sometimes I wonder myself. I've had a long. I've had the benefit of having a long career, uh, having worked at mostly mid-size and large companies. And having had the opportunity to lead different parts of the functions of the value chain of, of biopharma, so from regulatory to medical affairs to development, and at the core, I'm a, a career adventurist, and I like to take on challenges that I think are novel, meaningful, and will be challenging for me, but also leverage my past background. So while it's not been a linear path, it's sort of a bit of a natural evolution. Um, that I come to this role. And I specifically came to it because I was in the mix of, of Stanford during COVID. And mm -hmm. there was a team that was working on some very compelling science and they were exploring the potential utility in the context of COVID and respiratory disease. And I, after my stints in, in larger companies, uh, found myself hooked on, on the science and the opportunity to, to bring it to life, to, to pull it out of Stanford and to give it uh, commercial legs to advance development is what motivated me personally to join uh, the HALO team, which had just been established and, um, and to lead it to, to where we are today. Do you wanna talk more about the journey? Like how, like what does it take to bring a technology uh, from university to like startup and how do you grow the startup? So I can obviously share my experience. So when I joined, I was joining a team that had been working for many, many years on this scientific uh, platform. And I can tell you a little bit more about, uh, you know, what we're working on from a scientific perspective. But if I just keep it high level and conceptual for the moment, um, you know, we were at, at the core trying to explore the potential utility in COVID, uh, but the team had amassed both scientific research, but also intellectual property that resides at, uh, resided at Stanford exclusively. So we had, I think a, a twofold mission. One was how do we advance the science, both continuing to leverage the Stanford university platform, but also to pull it out so that some of the work being done meets industry and regulatory standards. Uh, and then simultaneously to set up from a company infrastructure standpoint, both to be able to hold the intellectual property and to advance our operational build uh, so that we can take on the activities that were being done from a more academic perspective. Those are probably the two um, challenges that we faced and continue to face. We're, we're actually still sort of squarely within uh, Stanford's four walls and, and received great advocacy and, and support uh, from the university for uh, both the science, but also for our emerging role as a startup to carry it forward. And uh, like, what was the journey to start this business? Like how, who came up with the idea, who owned the technology? How did you uh, leverage university resources, uh, launch this or scale your our team and uh, started working on like making progress on your drug candidate? Do you wanna shed more light on that journey? Sure. Um, so the team that had been established before is really based from the lab of uh, Dr. Right. Paul Boyke, who's a professor mm -hmm. at Stanford. And uh, he's worked alongside Nadine Nagy, one of our co-founders, 
uh, and a host of others on unlocking the meaning of the extracellular matrix in the context of a number of diseases that are characterized by inflammation and fibrosis. Right, and right. they've received, you know, millions of dollars in non-dilutive funding for the meaningfulness of their work and for advancing uh, in some of what HALO is taking on today. And so the team set up was really a, a core group of scientists. And there was a colleague of mine who is an MD, MBA named Andy Wardle, who mm -hmm. had the vision that we could launch this out of the university um, and initially set up Halo. I actually joined Halo during COVID when the team was uh -huh. exploring potential utility in COVID. And we spent a bit of time exploring the potential utility in COVID, but actually abandoned it after the market was, you know, turning itself to vaccines and mm -hmm. preventive measures. And we were a bit behind uh, the timeline for COVID. And um, that's a bit how we landed with our first uh, indication. So for HALO, mm -hmm. we're really focused on the utility of our mechanism in inflammation and fibrosis, broadly speaking, but specifically in our lead indication in pulmonary hypertension. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we landed there by marrying what is extensive preclinical data that have mm -hmm. been generated both at Stanford, but also outside of Stanford with some of our scientific collaborators at HALO um, with a phase one study, which we actually launched in the context of COVID. So we did a phase one study looking at potential of our compound at a few different doses to affect the levels of hyaluronin, which is a key component of the extracellular matrix um, in the lungs of patients in the sputum. Uh, and we were lucky enough to see a, a positive response on that pharmacodynamic marker and also confirm the safety and tolerability of, of this agent uh, in those patients. And that together with the preclinical data I was mentioning in the context of interstitial lung disease and pulmonary hypertension and fibrosis is what led to advanced clinical development in interstitial lung disease and pulmonary hypertension. Very inspiring journey. And for someone who doesn't understand uh, anything about your mission, vision, how would you define HALO Biosciences? Like what is HALO Biosciences? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So, I mean, at the core, we think we're sitting on an opportunity really to transform multiple diseases that are affected right. by inflammation and fibrosis, mm -hmm. both in terms of the pipeline that's been advanced and developed, and also just the utility of what is really a unique way of targeting um, these diseases. So as you likely know, and maybe others do as well, many you know targets tend to be cell level targets, pathway specific targets. Uh, obviously recently there's been gene level targets and right. targeting the extracellular matrix is actually a fairly unique um, right. way of going about drug development. And it's really what pulled me into the team because I saw very much the utility of targeting not only the extracellular matrix, but our target specifically, hyaluronin, as being very closely linked to clinical outcomes. And while we often follow the path of very interesting and cutting edge science, here we're marry marrying cutting edge science on the extracellular matrix with, with an opportunity to target it directly. Um, and it's, in my view, uh, with, with a very high likelihood of having potential clinical outcomes. And right. that's what matters to patients. That's what matters to the regulators. Um, yeah. Obviously that's how we're advancing clinical development. And, you know, I've worked on a number of programs that are very specific to a particular pathway or um, a set of polygenetic factors for a disease. And here our target is actually sugars. It's mm -hmm. a, a set of, you know, repeating disaccharides that present themselves in the extracellular matrix and they have a multitude of roles, both signaling, uh, but also structural. So they hold over a thousand times their weight in water. Um, and our agent, our lead agent and our pipeline aims to inhibit the synthesis of hyaluronin where it's overexpressed. Um, right. And we've seen it's overexpression in, in the context of multiple diseases. So that's a bit of the, the scientific platform and opportunity. And yeah, at the high level, why do we, why do you think targeting extracellular metrics will have higher efficacy or it will help us bring more uh, cures to the clinic uh, compared to targeting genes or more precise units like protein receptors? 
Uh, well, I can't say, I can't make a comparative efficacy claim, uh, and I don't know that we'll ever have the data to do that. But I think that what we do see is, you know, a high likelihood based on the structural role of the extracellular mm -hmm. matrix, right? You just sort of it's easy to ignore in some ways maybe the you know, the precision of you know cellular level analysis is so compelling you know dna is at the core of our life and so it's sometimes hard to imagine that you could target something that's in the extracellular matrix can you even do that um and and if so what are the implications but the broad base of engagement of the extracellular matrix in the diseases that we're studying is mm -hmm. what I think is is most compelling. So you know, of course, there's a lot of preclinical evidence of uh, this lead agent that we're working on. That's a repurposed compound um, as providing clinical validation for our work, uh, wherein you really see that both you see the the increase of let's say hyaluronin in the context of the extracellular matrix in take our our preclinical models of pulmonary hypertension, the bleomycin models, adenosine knockout models. Um, and uh, you see the increases in the context of underlying disease, and then you see an amelioration mm -hmm. um, with the use of this lead agent by, again, our work and that of others, um, and, uh, you know, leading to clinical, preclinical outcomes. So, okay. um, you know, the evidence is there preclinically. We've, we've shown an ability to reduce it in a, a tissue target of interest, the, the lung, um, and so we're following the path of, of development. And um, it makes it makes for some complexity. Um, single cell or gene specific targeting uh, is in some ways more precise, right? It's a bit the holy grail of medicine, and we're hoping to um, actually pursue precision medicine from a bit a di different angle, aiming to tie the uh, phenotypes of the patient populations that we think would respond best to the signature of our compound. Makes sense. And so do, you think, yeah. do you think that will potentially give you access to bigger market? It's because it's more platform approach. It's not limited to one or two specific genes or receptors, but it is more extracellular activities and to reverse those activities to cure patients. It's a good question. I think, um, you know, having spent a lot of time in multiple indications and um, work having had the opportunity to work on multiple products i actually think that you know targeting is is the way to go because you know typically mm -hmm. you're working with such heterogeneity of patients and of disease and progression and prognostic factors so the extent to which we can use you know the best in class of um you know prognostic factors for response Right. will likely lead to a more narrow target where we see a better outcome, um, but a stronger uh, opportunity to make a difference in those populations. I think the, the opportunity for our science to be broad is that it does have relevance for multiple types of conditions. But sure. I, I do believe that within each one of them, there likely are subsets of patients that are uh, likely to be better responders. And our, our mm -hmm. aim is to identify those and, and position our development uh, with those more narrow, likely to respond patient populations. Sure. If that makes sense. And if you look at the current market, all the drugs approved by FDA, what percentage of these drugs are focusing on extracellular metrics? Do you have any insight around this? Well, it's interesting you said, I don't have an insight on the percent. I mean, I'll have to look that up. Uh, in, in the curious. future, yeah. but you know what we've seen is so within our lead indication for folks that are uh, in the field of pulmonary hypertension, conducting research or an inter interstitial lung disease, when they're targeting a component of the extracellular matrix or trying to address, let's say, fibrosis directly, it still seems to be driven mostly by cell level targets um, mm -hmm. rather than directly. Uh, targeting the extracellular matrix. That's one of the things that's a bit unique because our compound is actually competing for a substrate that is required for the synthesis of hyaluronin. Um, so its mechanism is different. And if you know, or others know of, um, you know, either programs that are similarly targeting, targeting the extracellular matrix would we'll be de delighted to, to connect with, with folks to, to learn more. Makes a lot of sense. You mentioned patients' clinics a couple of times. Like in the drug discovery and development process, 
how important it is to involve patients early on and are you uh, planning to involve patients sooner rather than later or you think that will come uh, once the efficacy or once safety testing so preclinical work is done that's a great question um i'm biased though uh okay. <laughs> having spent a lot of time in industry in roles actually directly working with patients and having accountability for patient marketing and patient communications for a few programs in allergy, asthma, and multiple sclerosis, um, and cystic fibrosis. I, I've seen both the role of patient groups as it relates to industry, but also what I think contributes to a real difference in the tenor of how the work feels. And I, I you know, I'm on a personal level, very mission driven. And so connecting with you know, the, the patient groups in particular that represent the patient interests on the front line um, is both, I think, satisfying on a personal level because okay. those are the people that we are serving ultimately. Um, and, you know, the, the representatives from the associations are, are their, you know, surrogate representatives. Um, and I think um, equally tangible is the fact that if you get disconnected from you know, the patient, um, that you miss out on the insights of um, you know, both patient engagement, but what's important to them to help guide your, your efforts. And so in that spirit right now, we, we just have initiated um, some initial gate engagement with the Pulmonary Hypertension Association group, for example, Mm -hmm. and the pulmonary fibrosis groups. Um, we haven't engaged in formal um, relationships um, in part because of our early setup and, um, and our funding priorities as, as we're approaching a uh, fundraising. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, establishing those relationships, I think can't come you know, early enough. And you know, the ultimate benefit is you know, those organizations also aim to make available the knowledge of what trials are going on and are of course very interested in the latest mechanisms, in particular where you know, many diseases have very considerable unmet need. And that is certainly the case for pulmonary hypertension. So um, I, I think that engaging with the patient groups is, is critical both strategically, but also meaningful personally. Right, and I, I, I hear this a lot uh, in industry discussion that bringing patients early on and um, basically patient at the center of attention, what we are doing, right? Drugs, the key beneficiary is patient. So what are those ways to uh, really connect with patients? One is you mentioned uh, engaging with patient, uh, like, like groups, associations that you can connect with, engage them. But is there any database or any uh, services that companies can leverage to access our data of existing patients? So connecting, one is to basically get the patient sentiment, right? And to think more about the clinical trial recruitment. recruitment. Other patient, uh, uh, like focusing on patient can mean leveraging the data of existing drugs of, uh, uh, on these patients. Like what are those ways to engage with patient or leverage the patient community of bringing them in the drug discovery process in parallel? Yeah, that's a great, um... That's a great question. I think that at a very philosophical level, one of the things that I really appreciated when I joined uh, Genentech Roche was the notion that they were putting the patient at the center, but actually had a very specific way of actually operationalizing that. Mm -hmm. And that was different than some of my peer, uh, experiences in other companies where, of course, every company in biotech pharma aims to put the patient at the center, but to actually do so is pretty challenging. There's a lot of complexity in development and you're doing project management and working in Excel and PowerPoint and Word and having meetings. And so how do you actually put the patient in the middle of a decision and um, make sure that you're using both the engagement with them, but also the data um, appropriately? So that could be, I guess, a topic of an entirely different <laughs> discussion because um, it's pretty involved. But I, I do think that um, being judicious about the approach and engaging with patient associations is in part uh, a great starting point because there needs to be um, you know, a careful approach. There's a lot of incentive, obviously, for um, industry to have its products be successful and everyone wants their products to, to be efficacious and, and safe. And you know, I think the primary job of industry is to judiciously um, study the, uh, the true risk benefit profile uh, in a population. And 
that the patient groups tend to represent the patients, um, you know, very, um, very well. And, and so, you know, logistically, one way to engage is to actually provide support financially to those institutions that represent the patients. They often invest in both research and development, but also in uh, supporting patients directly uh, who have unmet needs beyond their therapy. Um, and they also tend to, in our field, for example, um, engage in the development of registries. So, and, and I think that's advanced significantly in the last 10 years, wherein the opportunity to, um, you know, uh, have a registry that follows patients um, that includes um, both the clinical uh, presentation right. of the, the disease uh, of a patient, but also um, collect some of the underlying data. And, and, and now often it, that's married with, um, you know, sample collection and analysis so that you can prognostically evaluate a multitude of factors. Um, right. And um, to, to date, we're looking at engaging directly through the, the associations right. um, and also through the investigators, right? The, the investigator community tends to be quite active in the universities, often themselves also are hosting registries um, that have the patient data itself. Sure. I'm asking this because every time, uh, like last 10 years, I spent a lot of time visiting biotech labs, life science labs. Uh, mainly private companies, but also uh, academic, big pharma, uh, small biotechs, incubators. And what I realize in the 10 years, if you see number of experiments companies have to do, they will probably reduce over time by leveraging more uh, in silico tools, by leveraging more access to data. And one of the uh, important source of data can be patients uh, uh, based on your target uh, uh, disease indications. So I always wonder like uh, how many years it will take to reduce uh, like like wet lab component, right? So more work is done in dry lab leveraging the data. So maybe 10% of unique experiments are done by company and the rest of the work is uh, done in dry lab generating the data, but uh, we need more pre-competitive -com collaboration among pharma, biotech, uh, university labs. We need well-structured data of current, current patients. So we are not repeating experiments. If we someone already tested similar drug focusing on similar yeah. component in extracellular metrics, and they have that data. So maybe if they can share it, it's not necessarily giving them any competitive edge. Maybe if they share it, it can reduce number of experiments. So like, what do you think? How can we move towards more uh, like unique or innovative experiments rather than doing uh, more mundane experiments or maybe mundane is not the right term, but uh, doing more non-trivial experiments or non-unique experiments or repeating the same thing uh, by biotech companies, pharma companies? That's a good question. I'm not sure I have the best answer. Some of the folks uh, on uh, on the team may have a better insight than I, especially those that are you know directly leading some of the you know in vitro and in vivo experiments, and could imagine how they could produce <laughs> some of the stuff that's being done that uh, seems redundant. Um, right. You know, one point I I would offer is that um, in the world of you know clinical research, you see this as well, and that's a bit more. Uh, where I'm familiar with um, data sets and the challenges of um, you know, analyzing them in part because there's a lack of harmonization. And so um, you know, that I imagine, and we know is, is an issue with regard to all data, right? So you know, within a particular field of work, harmonization on what are the biomarkers of interest? What are the clinical outcomes of interest? And how do we even code them? What variables do we agree to? I mean, it requires collaboration and agreement um, mm -hmm. to, I think, create standards that then give the data more utility across the boundaries of organizations. And I can say that, you know, for us at Halo, some of the work we've been focused on, we're really anchoring to a new formulation for the, the agent that now is being used for clinical validation. 
Um, and, you know, we have some insight on to how to optimize both the, the parent compound as well as the active metabolite um, in terms of what we hope to uh, optimize for the uh, uh, clinical utility of, of the agent. Right. And uh, in some of that work, the in silico modeling that has been done, which is you know quite early still, um, has been wonderful to to see because you know we've been able to leverage other drugs that are looking at you know similar approaches to formulation, and you know mapping our own compounds um, profile, um, you know from experiments that our our team has generated to develop in silico models that are, you know, with, with a range of predictability that I think will have great utility, but also avoids us from having to, you know, do all of that all over again. So at least for us, it's happening a a little bit. (laughs) Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. I think it, it's always smart to leverage existing uh, data to move fast because the whole uh, drug discovery and development is a a game of failing fast, right? So you need to fail fast and uh, stick with things that really work or double down on things things that uh, really work. I've thought a lot about recently this notion of failing fast and the extent to which it's, you know, relevant for tech, but maybe a little bit less relevant for biotech. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, given our long lead times for, you know, virtually everything that we undertake and um, so I'm not sure I have an answer on it, but it feels like fail fast sometimes is more Silicon Valley friendly and not as biotech <laughs> pharma friendly. <laughs> yeah, no, no makes sense. I, I'm thinking about failing fast in terms of if you see uh, drugs that reach clinical trial, right? Like only few, I don't remember the exact percentage, but only few percentage go to the clinic. So uh, if let's say I'm throwing a random number, let's say 90% of the drug or 70% of the drug uh, that uh, reached the clinical trial state, what if we uh, identified they're gonna fail sooner because they wasted so many resources and uh, drugs are arguably expensive, not just because of one drug, but also uh, for all the drugs that failed, that didn't work. So I was thinking that uh, that terms, what if we, can identify these winning horse horses sooner and bet on them rather than taking 10, 15 candidates to the clinic and just to realize they're gonna fail. And then we focus on the winning horse. So it's too late, if that makes sense. We already spend a lot of money. Yeah, it's you know, it's a good point. And I think that um, you know, part of it it's the nature of the early work, right? So the preclinical no, work. Uh, yeah. versus the clinical work. And it's probably one of the reasons I didn't really connect with it until I was listening to you, but why I find what we're working on so compelling because we're working on a reformulation of a drug that's been approved many years ago right. in Europe. It's not available in the US. So that's an opportunity um, from you know, a market perspective, but we have you know 2,600 patients worth of clinical trial data and an approved use, which is entirely unrelated to the use that we are working on. And right. the utility of the compound in the extracellular matrix has only come to light with you know the last years of you know cutting edge research. But the compound right. itself is um, you know quite old, approved in the 70s in Europe. Um, but the actual, um, ability to know that it will pass clinical muster with the standard of safety and tolerability, um, is invaluable because as, as you know, as you're describing, many folks are working on the 20 compounds of which five, you know, seem promising in vitro and three seem promising in vivo. And then they reach the clinic and, you know, possibly, you know, fail because of an unforeseen safety um, event. And of course, we don't know the full safety and tolerability profile of the compound until we carry it through research, but we have a very strong base of background that, you know, de-risks the opportunity, um, which is very compelling. Yeah. Yeah. And would love to know more about focusing more on repurposing a route because uh, that obviously gives you access to a lot of data and really move fast. And maybe number of testing experiments done uh, are are less than if you start a drug or some really innovative uh, drug from and create it from scratch. So do you wanna talk about how repurposing approach is different from traditional drug discovery and development? 
Sure. Um, well, I, I've come up the learning curve of repurposing <laughs> in the, in the yeah. last 18 months. I had never worked on a repurposed drug uh, in the past. I've always sort of followed the, the conventional path of um, products that are uh, novelly developed and have composition of matter IP. And there are both, I think, strengths as well as, you know, trade-offs in, in the pursuit of repurposed drugs. So I would say maybe the, some of the core differences relate to on uh, perhaps the most important uh, uh, anchor, if you will, from a business perspective is the intellectual property. So, yes. you know, we're working with a compound that has an expired patent mm -hmm. and our team has garnered method of use IP, uh, which we've bolstered and continue to bolster with our formulation related work um, right. and you know, other proprietary things I shouldn't talk about uh, yeah. publicly. <laughs> um, and, you know, it provides us a strong patent fence, um, mm -hmm. you know, for our work, but it is not the same as composition of matter IP. Uh, and that can right. be challenging, I think, in particular from an investment perspective. Um, on the flip side, from a core development standpoint, as we think about the activities that we're undertaking, we're a very small an organization. We're just spinning out of Stanford, mm -hmm. but yet we've been able to uh, launch right now. We have three clinical trials. Wow. Uh, to, one of which is enrolling patients, two of which are imminently planned. And we mm -hmm. have two preclinical studies uh, that are happening simultaneously. And that we're able to do because uh, the, the drug was developed uh, for another purpose and you know is, right. is available uh, commercially. And so uh, the ability to advance much more rapidly into the clinic um, and leverage the data that exists, the, the toxicology data and in-market commercial data, the, the approved labels of the products is uh, something that's certainly an advantage. Um, and, you know, we aim to be able to marry all that work with our formulation strategy and our uh, preclinical work um, to a phase two study in much more right. rapid time than if we were initia initiating it without that data. Um, and right. so, you know, there are regulatory pathways that afford the opportunity to do that in, in the U.S. And, and elsewhere. And um we are also able to be much more capital efficient. Uh, we're not having okay. to repeat all the things that were done previously, but some of, some of the work is to, to modernize things like the tox package that's right. um, available to support uh, the ultimate approval for our uh, drug and our, and our pipeline. Right, and if you have to go specific to like studies we have to do for any drug to take them to, the, uh, to clinical trial, uh, whether it's DMPK, uh, other safety, uh, animal studies, like, like what's the difference when you are just doing repurposing? Do you think you, uh, like, uh, regulatory agencies allow you to leverage all the safety data and just only do um, a few uh, experiments to show the drug is safe enough, even after those modifications you made? Or like, what are those uh, other benefits in terms of are different uh, preclinical and even before preclinical studies? Yeah, I think it's a very challenging question, <laughs> a very technical question. But I think at the core, you know, you might imagine that if you were initiating with a compound uh, that you wanted to bring to a pre-IND, that yeah. you might have a few years of work and a few million dollars worth of work to do the full GLP tox package alongside some of the preclinical work. And right. Uh, for certain repurposed drugs, there's an opportunity to leverage the existing uh, toxicology data that was done. In our right. case, in the case of many others, that data is quite old. So likely there's an, uh, a need to redo, if right. you will, to modern standards, some of the toxicology in particular. Um, but uh, the, you know, the pathway is shorter, the, the resources required are, are fewer. Um, but the complexity, of course, on the reformulation always calls into question, um, you know, what the changes will mean in terms of safety and efficacy, and, and that does warrant additional testing. No, makes a lot of sen sense. Very insightful. We, we talked about putting patients at the center. What about involving regulatory agencies uh, early on? Because most biotech companies, they focus on uh, science early on, but uh, do you have any recommendation or from your experience, like how important is it to involve, let's say, FDA 
sooner rather than later? That's a, a good question. I have limited experience in that space um, because this is the earliest that I've worked. <laughs> I typically have worked in phase two programs and, and beyond, as you sure. can probably tell from the nature of some of my answers. Um, but my own sense is that what is critical is ensuring that there's a focus on the regulatory principles, even if there isn't engagement by the FDA. So um, engagement by the FDA once you get to the clinical, clinical trial uh, stage so that there is an understanding and an aligned agreement and initiation of dialogue on what the development path is, is mm -hmm. definitely critical, right? And um, you know, I've seen many cases where it's very um uh, collaborative. I've seen other cases where it seems a little bit more antagonistic, and I think that the approach from industry to um, to engage the FDA early and to solicit advice is, you know, is best in class and and the way to go. Um, for those that are maybe earlier uh, and not ready to gauge engage mm -hmm. uh, regulators. I think one of the key lessons that I've learned over time is that sometimes, from a scientific perspective, there's an over um, overly acute focus on something that may be scientifically really interesting and not necessarily lead to clinical outcomes. And um, I can give you an example uh, where, you know, in the study of let's say multiple sclerosis, where mm -hmm. you have lesions in the brain, there, there are sometimes, you know, there are folks who are studying the, the effect of different agents on uh, lesion volume, for example, and MRI outcomes. And in the end, the FDA will not care about an MRI outcome, which seems crazy. Right. You could actually eliminate the you know, lesions from the brain uh, and uh, believe that in hand you have a drug that works. And without the tide of the clinical outcomes, uh, it, it won't pass muster. It also won't pass muster with patients because obviously uh, that's what the FDA is trying to do is represent the patient interests and, and the clinical outcomes are, are what are meaningful. Right. So I think that bridge between, you know, pure scientific discovery and the biological relevance and then the tie to clinical outcomes is for early stage research, maybe more important than direct engagement with, mm -hmm. with regulators. Um, but of course, the first opportunity to present and to develop a thoughtful right. clinical development plan is, is the great time to engage. No, it makes a lot of sense. And one question out of curiosity, because every founder um they have a mission right so where do you see your company halo bioscience in 10 years and what impact uh, you strive to make uh, in the next decade you know i i said earlier that you know our mission is really to transform multiple diseases that are characterized by inflammation and fibrosis and so over the course of 10 years i imagine the journey looks a little bit like advancing our, our lead compound in pulmonary hypertension and interstitial lung disease. It's specific, it's targeted, it's a significant unmet need. And even from a capital perspective, it's likely the way to, to focus, to advance, to unlock the rest of the potential of both the pipeline, so other assets mm -hmm. that we are seeking to uh, develop further and to conduct, conduct a um, evaluation as you're describing, uh, maybe a fail fast model for some of our early pipeline uh, compounds and, you know, to advance them into other indications following additional preclinical work um, and engagement with patient groups and investigators on um, the other indications that would stand to, to benefit most from our, our mechanism. And uh, I think the, the opportunity as I see it is very transformative. Um, you know, today, you know, the Lancet might estimate that 50% of all disease uh, that leads to mortality is characterized by inflammation and fibrosis. We're not aiming for, you know, all diseases, as I was mentioning right. earlier, and there are a few already that we have in mind where we think the utility is very high, but, um, you know, there's certainly an opportunity to both advance with our repurposed compound, but then to unlock the value of the pipeline of proprietary assets. Uh, that should, in the footsteps of, of our lead, have great utility. Love it. We need more mission-driven founders like you, for sure, to uh, make this world disease-free, hopefully. So we focus not just on saving uh, lives, we focus more on enhancing life, right? More augmenting life. Currently, pharma industry, biotech industry, they focus more on life-saving drugs 
uh, for obvious reason, we have over 10,000 uh, diseases desperately waiting for cures, but um, I would love to live in a world and it can happen with uh, more bioentrepreneurs like you uh, to really cure uh, all the diseases uh, in the uh, future. Uh, so we focus more on good stuff, more augmenting human life and enhancing human life, not just uh, saving uh, human lives. So very inspiring. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I really, uh, I'm inspired by the science of what the team that you know, precedes my time at Halo has, has built uh, uh, and has um, unlocked the opportunity for us to actually reach patients. It's a very long journey, as you know, so. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, it's a bit our mission to carry it forward. Totally. One uh, question, starting a business is always very challenging, but starting a bio business, like biotech business is way more challenging, uh, as you said, because of longer life cycle of uh, products you work on. So what lessons you learned uh, from the day you started uh, this business and now you are uh, uh, taking making progress in your drug candidates? What advice would you give to other bio entrepreneurs in early stage or even aspiring bio entrepreneurs uh, starting a drug, a biopharma business? That's a good question. I would say in, in my learnings, um, because this is a new journey for me uh, as well, uh, having a strong network has really mm -hmm. been key. Folks who are in a similar role, just on a personal level, being able to connect uh, with people who are facing the same challenges is, is definitely important. It's not maybe as tangible as what you were looking for in terms of advice, but I think it's, um, it's very critical. Um, and, uh, you know, that that's one point. Another point would be that um, I've really learned that um, the importance of prioritization in a very different way than what I had ever worked on previously. So being very small in scale means right. that we've got to be very disciplined on what are we achieving this week? What are we achieving next month? Uh, and how do we put aside the, you know, 200 things that we think need to be done uh, right. and to be pretty ruthless on prioritizing that which we think will advance us and which is obviously feasible um, mm -hmm. as well. And um, as a third point, I would say that, you know, if, if what you're working on and what your team is working on is very compelling scientifically, then there's an opportunity to find the advocates uh, and non-dilutive sources of funding that can help advance alongside the build of a proper business case um, right. and, um, and to establish the infrastructure sort of one, one step at a time. And, um, and maybe the last insight would be for us, um, there's a bit of a mindset change that I've been trying to impose on us as a team. And it probably comes from the fact that I come from industry and right. most of our collaborators are in academia. And one of the challenges I've seen in what I might describe as an academic um, uh, spirit and you know a, approach and ecosystem, and it's one of the reasons why academia is full of innovation, Right. is that there are so many potential applications and so many things to study. Uh, and um, and it's hard to advance with a singular focus. I, I guess right. I was saying this point a little bit earlier as well, but for us, right. it's meant really focusing on pulmonary hypertension and interstitial lung disease while the utility and the preclinical models um, bring us into many areas of potential focus, but being diligent in not only focusing on uh, that in, as an initial lead indication, but then also engaging the people who are leaders in that space um, to get feedback on what we're doing, to, to advance and develop our plans. But with, with that single objective in mind of you know, clinical development in this indication, I think has provided us with a, a focus and, and enabled us to, to advance. I, I learned this uh, as well while after starting a business because entrepreneurs at heart, they are overexcited people, right? They, they love new ideas, they wanna try everything, but to scale and early on that helps, right? To innovate, but when you wanna execute and scale your business, you need like, like focus religiously and to make progress, right? That's the key difference between, as you said, academia and a biotech uh, startup or biotech world, right? Academia, I think they are playing a great role 
in coming up with great ideas and coming up with 10,000 um, uh, potential uh, multi-billion dollar businesses, right? But now yeah. it's the job of uh, entrepreneurs to pick those unique ideas and uh, really make like uh, dedicate uh, uh, rest of their life or at least a decade uh, <laughs> taking that to like realizing that vision or yeah. uh, really executing yeah. it so takes a lot of effort. You know, as you're talking, I was struck by the fact that, you know, why is that the case? And I think in part, it's just the nature of maybe entrepreneurship versus, you know, execution and operations. Um, but I also, you know, and, and the tension there, but I also think that the capital intensity of our business is a big reason right. for it, right? Um, right? Because to advance the clinic is a huge requirement of an investment. So the setup for that, um, you know, at, at organizations that have very small scale and limited resources doesn't really enable one to advance on three or four different indications, you know, simultaneously, even though it seems okay. theoretically possible, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's too much of an undertaking, even for pharma, that's, that's challenging. So. Right. Totally. I will just ask one last question. I, I think we are almost on time. So you have very rich and diverse experience, including big pharma. And now you are uh, leading the team at biotech startup. So like, where do you see, like, what is the future of drug discovery, R&D, or the whole drug industry? Um, we have seen like big pharma, the, the whole decline in innovation, and uh, uh, there is quite a bit decrease uh, in uh, return on research investment if you compare big pharma from smaller companies. So where do you see, is, like, what is the future of drug uh, R&D? Do you think that will be... Uh, done in a, with a different model, or we will see more drug candidate move uh, from big pharma to small biotech. They're already contributing a lot of drugs, at least they initiate these uh, drugs and then collaborate with pharma in late stages. So what yeah. are your thoughts about the future of this industry and how the model will shift towards more efficient, more productive, um, our direction. Good question. I'm not sure I have a crystal ball. Uh, I'm not quite a futurist, but I think that, you know, what, what I can see is if I look past, uh, look to the past as a, as a predictor of the future, uh, it does seem as though in the last 10 to 15 years, most big pharma have made strategic steps to engage in investing uh, in their early portfolio of research in particular in the ecosystem of both academia and small startups to both enrich the, their pipeline and to um, you know, bring that innovative, what we were just describing as, as possibly a handicap. So the innovation and chasing down different ideas and which does really lead to innovation that is harder to foster in a big company environment. You know, my, my last organization, 100,000 people. And right. despite a commitment to innovation and being agile, it's very hard to do so in a way that is compatible with the need to review multiple compounds at multiple review committees and you know, assess trade-offs between 100 simultaneously running programs. And there's just inherently a, a challenge in being nimble um, mm -hmm. and being fast. And so, you know, my own, um, you know, this is again, you know, early research is not my area of expertise, but my own site is that, you know, industry itself uh, and Genentech Roche took an early, um, you know, position in, in that model where very direct engagement with academia and investing more in external acquisition of assets, um, you know, has, has become uh, the, the basis for a bigger proportion of the pipeline than internally generated research uh, and early right. development. And I, I would imagine that's going to uh, continue um, is, is my prediction. <laughs> I agree with you. If you yeah. follow the trend, drug R&D has become distributed, right? 20 years ago, if you go to any big pharma, probably 10, 15% uh, of their R&D was externalized. But now if you go to any big pharma, I think close to 50%, if not 50% of their mm -hmm. R&D is externalized, but then the form of outsourcing, collaboration, tech transfer. So we will see this distribution in the whole R&D uh, space uh, growing over time. 
maybe we will have a uh, multi billion dollar big pharma completely virtual uh, in the next decade or so we already have virtual biotechs um, success stories and uh, but they still rely on big pharma for commercialization even manufacturing regulatory approval process uh, but uh, if we keep working on this network approach uh, I, I think we will see more a virtual a model even in big pharma uh, in the near future but that's that's really exciting and uh, i want to thank you for your time it's uh, your journey your mission your work is very inspiring we totally 100% need more bio entrepreneurs like you so thank you so much for your time anisa now oh, well thank you for hosting what is a growing ecosystem of um, you know, biotech uh, individuals, groups, collaborators, um, you know, uh, you're an inspiring um, interviewer, but also, you know, on your own, really uh, steward, I think, an, an advance for industry that's critical. You're part of the ecosystem of what you were just describing we need to have. So much appreciation for the opportunity to chat with you today. And of course, we'll look forward to staying in touch. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon, Anissa. Bye. Bye-bye. This video is sponsored by SciSpot, the best tech stack for modern biotech.